Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to first thank, uh, thank uh, take this opportunity to thank CETA for giving me this uh, fellowship because it allows me to stay a bit longer in Montreal and continue this research. So thank you very much to all the staff. And uh, so I'm, don't hesitate to interrupt me during this uh, presentation. This is, I'm really looking forward to some inputs or thoughts you can have about all this kind of new modeling I've been developing. Basically, the whole idea behind this project is to try to assess the long-term effects of magnetic interactions between stars and planets when a planet is very close, close to, the, to, to its whole star. And one of the motivation for, so I, I like also to acknowledge my colleagues here, uh, uh, Alan Sachabran and uh, Victor Reville from SACLA in France and Sean Matt from Exeter. Uh, so we, um, one of the motivation here is simply that if you look at the distribution of known exoplanets, so this is the latest, one of the latest database from exoplanet.eu, depending on the database you choose, you don't have exactly the same number of confirmed planets, but anyway, uh, this is, I took the database like a week ago, so this is quite, uh, uh, the latest ones. Uh, so I plot uh, the distribution of known exoplanets we have in terms of mass of the planet uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Earth's mass units against the semi-major axis of their orbits. And you always see the semi-major axis in terms of AU or period, or orbital period or stuff. Here I put it in terms of stellar radii from what I divided by the, uh, the radius of their host so that you can get an idea of how close those things are in terms of dimensions compared to the dimension of the central body, which is a star. And so you see you have a large distribution that would be Earth here. And if you do the histograms of the distribution against the semi-major axis, you see that non exoplanet it's log scale, the peak around 20 stellar radii, and we have a lot of very close exoplanets we know of. So this is very close. These are very close systems, right? Uh, and so when you notice this, that you say, okay, how do this planet interact with their host? Is it different from the solar system? We don't have such close. Uh, planets in the solar system, so how does all this, all this work? And you can also ask, well, here at the color code is just for different uh, stellar types, as you can uh, certainly have guessed from this plot here. But for instance, for, uh, for the, the Loma stars, uh, we, know, we expect that the habitable zone around those stars can be very close. Uh, here is a, a diagram again. Uh, it's reversed compared to the previous one. So you have the semi-major axis of a pla the planet here as a function of the planet mass. So it's the same thing that before, but reversed. And it's zoomed uh, around. Uh, so to, to, to see up here, for instance, for M6 or M8 uh, stars, I put here the band that we expect uh, to be the habitable zone. So around for an M8, for instance, it's between something like 20 and, uh, and 40 stellar radii. For an M6, it's much further away. And I put all the known planets around M stars in this, in this zoomed plot here. And so you can ask, okay, but for instance, if we found a planet that is that close to the star, so from atmosphere, an atmospheric perspective, you can say, okay, maybe this planet could be habitable, but there are a lot of other stuff going on here, and so we need to refine our definition of such habitable zones, for instance. And that's where uh, typically the um, uh, magnetic interaction could, uh, could, uh, could enter the picture. And I'd like just to, to, to do some uh, just advocacy publicity here because we have a project, uh, so a, a trans project between Canada and France and other countries called SPIRU, which is a spectrophotometer for infrared. That's one of the main targets. It will be installed on CFHT in like two, uh, 2017. And it's main, one of the main science targets is to find a bunch of planets in this region here, basically in the habitable zone around Andorra. Okay. So to put it in a nutshell, what is the difference between, for, between those planets that orbit very close to their host and what we know in the solar system? So the first obvious thing I want to point out, and this will be mainly what I'm be focusing here on, is that they interact with a much stronger stereoing, 
Tailwind magnetic field. So you can get really something that's completely different from what we expect in, uh, for solar system planets. They, they're also much closer to their host, so they can develop a stronger tidal interaction, of course. They are exposed to stronger radiation from the host. They are a bit in a denser interplanetary medium because they are so close to their stars. So the stellar wind there is expected to be much denser than typically what's uh, for, the, for the, the Earth. And so on. And the list could, could go on and on uh, like this. And one, par one particular thing that is particularly interesting is that eventually some of those planets are going to orbit in what's called the uh, subalvanic region of the stellar wind, meaning that they orbit in the region where the wind velocity is smaller than the local wind uh, velocity in the stellar wind. And in this kind of case, you can get a direct magnetic connection between the two bodies. So this is just a, a, a sketch that I took from a paper from Procedal in 2006. So if the planet is in the subalvanic sub region of the wind, then any perturbation that the planet uh, is, uh, is, uh, is inducing in the interplanetary medium. This perturbation, because we are in the subalvanic region, it can propagate uh, down to the star, eventually come back, depending on the local property of the plasma there. And then you can establish a connection there. There is a strong link uh, uh, of this kind of setup with, for instance, interaction of satellites in a planet's magnetosphere. This is a kind of same interaction that you can develop. On the contrary, for all the, uh, the solar system planets, uh, all the solar system planets are in the superalvanic uh, region of the solar wind. And then if you're in the superalvanic region of your wind, you can develop a shock, a bow shock in front of your, uh, of your planet. Uh, and any perturbation caused by an orbital motion of a planet in the stellar wind will just propagate in the stellar wind but cannot reach back to the sun in the case of the solar system. So really have a, a strong difference between those two uh, scenarios. Now, this is a simple picture. So we also have, when, you, when a planet is in orbit very close to its star, the uh, orbital motion can be very big here compared to the local typical uh, speed of the, of the wind. So you can d distinguish several cases as to, for instance, where does this shock, can a shock occur? And what is the geometry of this shock? So this would be a typically um, the case of a solar system planet. You have a distant planet. The orbital motion is small compared to typically the, uh, the, uh, the, the radial velocity you, you get from the wind. And then you develop a bow shock in front in, in the line of sight between the planet and the star. Now, if, if it's the other way around, and then you are, uh, you're much closer to your star, and then the velocity of the, of the wind is not that high, because it's, since the, the, the wind is expanding, and it's accelerating upwards when you close, it's not that high. Then you, you can be completely dominated by your more orbital motion here. And then you can have a shock that is just in front of the orbiting planet. You can have an intermediate case, of course, where you, because of the two effects, you have, a, you have a certain angle compared to the orbital motion for the shock. But also, you can have no shock at all. Because if you're in the subalvanic region of the wind and that this, this delta U here is not high enough, then you don't develop any shock at all. Now, all this is for very simple axisymmetric picture. But when you get to real systems, we know that stars, for instance, are very complex, and they can have very complex magnetic fields. And when you're that close to the star here, you can, you can have very complex shape of your magnetosphere, of the magnetosphere of the, of the corona, basically, of the star. So this is, a, this is one example from a, when I'm a, a colleague from MIT, uh, uh, Cohen. Uh, it's the example of a, a stellar wind uh, um, modelization for the M dwarf EVLAC driven by uh, observed magnetic fields at the, at the photosphere of EVLAC. And so what he showed here, which is very interesting, is that from this simulation of the stellar wind, he shows in white the location of the alvenic transition in the wind. So if you're in, inside this uh, white region here, then the local speed of the wind is smaller than the local advent speed. And if you're outside, it's the opposite. And so you, and those here, those blue uh, circles here, are the orbits of known planets around this star. So when you start to take into account that, well, the topology is not axisymmetric and you can have a lot of things going on, you see that those planets here, as they orbit inside the, the stellar wind structure, they just constantly change region and they may be in the subalvanic, 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 subalvanic regime. So you start to enter a very complex case when 
overall, it's very difficult to say something about the secular evolution due to this kind of interactions. And this is what just an illustration. If you take a snapshot of a simulation of the wind and do a small box around it and put a planet in it, you get a subalvanic interactions or a subalvanic where we, I don't know if you can see it with the, with the, the contrast here, but you see the bow shock, a hint of the bow shock here in front of it. Okay. So if we want to be more, a, a bit more quantitative and try to estimate what are the effects of all those, the first thing to do is to say, okay, if you give me one star, how do I know where this alvanic transition occurs? And then you can start to say something about the planets that are eventually, uh, that are maybe orbiting around it. So how do we do that? One of the, of the way to do that is to use numerical simulations to compute uh, stellar winds. Uh, you can do a Parker wind for the for, for first time, so that you don't need numerical simulation. You just do the analytical, analytical solution. But as, as soon as you, you put some uh, geometrical constraints, as soon as you go, for instance, just to the axisymmetric wind, then there is no satisfying analytical complete solution of the global structure and of the torque, typically, that will be applied by the wind and all the global properties. So you need numerical simulations to do that at some point. And so this is what I'm going to show you here. So we developed some, uh, some of those simulations using uh, a code called Pluto, which is uh, an MHD compressible code, fi finite volume uh, method. And uh, we, we are modeling thermally driven winds. All I'm going to speak about applies to cool stars uh, for all the uh, type of stellar winds, then we need to, to define things differently here. So this is just a, a, the initial, typically an initialization of a 2D axisymmetric wind. I start on the left, you see the density in, in color contrast. So you see that, of course, density is just uh, decreasing uh, logarithmically. Uh, as you go away from the star. Uh, in white arrows, you see the, the velocity of the wind initialize a, a symmetric, symmetrically spheric, uh, spherically symmetric, sorry, uh, uh, Parker wind. So, so I have a, an initial condition that is just a, an expanding wind. And I put a dipole field here. And then I will let the simulation evolve. And those, those lines here, the black line and the dashed line, label the various uh, typical surface. So the, 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 the black line here is the sonic surface, where the, the, the wind goes from subsonic to supersonic. And the dashed and, uh, lines uh, are the several Alvin surfaces, because you can develop, you can, uh, sorry, define several Alvin surfaces. Whether you are uh, based on the magnetosonic modes, you can develop in uh, such, uh, such plasma. And on, on the right, you will see the azimutal component of the magnetic fields that will develop. So this is just small movies to show you that. So you need some numerical simulations to do that. So you start with a very simple setup, and then you just obtain a steady state at some point, where depending on the, typically the amplitude of the magnetic field and on the, uh, on the temperature of your, uh, of your star, then you obtain a solution where some of the field lines are open, some are remain closed on the, uh, on the equator here for the dipolar structure. And you form some sometimes more complex shape of those uh, surfaces. And from that, you can estimate, for instance, what is the torque applied by the wind to the star, what is the mass loss rate, etc., etc. And you see here for a dipolar case, you see that in this region, we don't have any azimuthal field, meaning that in fact, what's occurring here is that it's what we call a dead zone or a streamer in stellar wind. So those field lines here are just rotating solidly with the, with the star. And here, they are just trailing behind, which is why you have creation of B5 too. Uh, so OK, so this is the fast uh, magnetosonic surface yeah. here. And this is the slow one here. OK. okay. The and the black is the sonic line. Here? So here is the, the azimuthal magnetic field. Yes. OK, so when you switch from north to south equator, of course, you have the opposite side. Yeah. How do you drive the wind again? It's imposed. OK, so it's imposed. So I specify a dipolar structure here. Uh, I specify a rotation rate, and I specify typically a temperature that gives me a, a pressure gradient, typically, in fact. It's, yeah, so it's always thermally driven for, for those uh, simulations. And so uh, you can uh, recast that in, uh, in uh, a dimensionalized uh, parameter. Basically, what you need to set is a sound speed here, an alvent speed, and a rotation, uh, a rotation rate. 
And once you once you use that, then you're you set up. And of course, some prescription for the uh, for the uh, equation of state for your plasma. Hmm. Uh, the uh, I should point. I will not. Well, I could spend more time if you want. I have some slides in, in backup for that. But designing boundary conditions for such winds are not trivial, actually. And if you want to enforce uh, satisfying properties in the wind, such as you, you you want to verify that you're conserving the quantities you're supposed to conserve, it's quite hard, in fact, to develop uh, uh, accurate uh, solutions. So with uh, with Sean Matt, who, uh, who is an expert on those simulations, we developed. A specific boundary condition with different layers in which we successively impose the condition of the wind. So typically, the outer layer of the of the boundary condition here, you will, we will impose only the rotation rates. And then, as you move inward inside your your star, we impose more and more things. And on the last layer of the boundary condition here, you just impose everything. So rotation rate, uh, density, pressure, uh, and uh, magnetic field. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Once you resolve simulations, that's, that are very nice, they are adimensionalized, so you can do a parameter study. So that's, that's what we did with a, with, my, with a PhD student in France, Victor Reville. Uh, the, the paper is now out, I think it was out uh, last month. So what we did here is that we took one solution and we just vary all the, par the parameters, mainly the rotation rate and the magnetic field, and see how those surfaces change and what, how those properties of, uh, of the wind change. So, this is just an example. Uh, you see, started from this solution here. If you increase the rotation rate, you directly see that the, typically the advanced surface on the pole just expands and at the equator shrinks here. And the same occurs if you increase the magnetic field, and in fact, every, the advanced surface everywhere just increases in size. And so you directly see where I'm going from here because so this is just for winds, but if you put a planet somewhere here, nearby your star that is in orbit on the equatorial plane, then you need to know where this transition exactly occur to know in which uh, kind of interaction you're susceptible, which kind of interaction you're susceptible, susceptible to, to, do, to have. And so just to advocate this study, because it was a very nice study, we also uh, considered uh, all other topologies for the magnetic field just to have a, a generalized law for typically what is the torque. And so this is an example of the same plots, but for a quadrupolar topology, and we also do, did the octupolar topology. And in the end, we have a very nice parameterization of all the properties of the winds of depending on the topology. But thanks to this study, now, if I come back only to the star-planet interaction business, uh, the idea is to say, okay, where on the equatorial plane only does the advenic transition occur? And this is what I show you here as a function of the rotation rate of the star and distance to the star. Those two red lines here determine the alvenic transition and the superalvenic transition in the stellar wind. So this plot is done for one uh, parameter epsilon here, which is a measure of the magnetic field uh, normalized to the mass loss rate of the, uh, of the wind. So as you vary this parameter, of course, those lines here will just move like this. Okay. Yes, exactly. It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's because uh, you have a couple. You have a mixed. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so from this, if you have one stellar wind that you know of, uh, then you know its epsilon value. You know the rotation rate of the star. So you can say, okay, I'm in this region of this uh, this graphic here. And if I know that the planet is here, then it's in the superalvenic region of the wind, and it's. It does not uh, induce anything magnetically to the to the to its whole star. If I'm in this region here, which is a wind dead zone, uh, then you can have a connection that occurs. Now, the primary uh, engine to develop those magnetic interaction is just a differential motion between the orbit of the planet and the rotation of the wind. Okay, so I can compute here on this graph where does those two uh, velocities match and where, in fact, the magnetic interaction just stops. So inside this region, it's labeled by this black line here. So if I put a planet in this position for, uh, for a star that rotates at this, rota this uh, rotation rate, then the planet is just rotating much faster than the, the stellar wind. If I'm in the green zone here, it's the, it's the other way around. This 
line exists here because in all this region, the wind is just rotating solidly with, with, the, with the star. Outside, it's not true. So if you just, by conservation of angular momentum here, outside the star, if I pl plot the same, uh, the same uh, line here, we know that the rotation, the rotation uh, velocity of the wind goes like r to the minus 1. So this gives you this plot here. Okay. So now, this is the basic idea. Uh, so just the basic idea you can get just by studying the, the structure of your wind. Again, if you, for instance, keep the same mass loss rate but decrease the magnetic field, then zone line gets shifted and only a few uh, orbital uh, radii are, uh, can, can, can develop such interactions. If you go, for instance, for stellar values, solar values, sorry, so epsilon of the order of 1,000 here, uh, then you can expand much more. And you, in this region, for a slowly rotating star, for like, the sun, like the sun, for instance, if we have planets uh, up to something like, uh, uh, that, that, that would be something like uh, 15 maybe or 18 stellar radii, then you, can, you could develop such uh, subalvanic interaction here. You, you had a very special structure at the equator. Absolutely, so this is true, this is true for uh, dipolar, uh, dipolar dominated uh, stellar winds. Now what's interesting is that if you, for instance, take the two, uh, two, two, two two principal modes, let's say, so dipole or quadrupole. For a quadrupolar field, you don't have such a dead zone here. But for something like from the first 10, 15 percent of uh, inside the Alvin surface on the, on the equator, on the equator for a, a quadrupole, the, the, the wind is still rotating uh, like a solid body with the star. And then it's just fall off. So you, you would have something that would be much more like this here. OK. Um, so, okay, uh, now from just those expectations, if I just simply put some planets there randomly and see, okay, if the magnetic interaction was transferring, ang transferring angular momentum and if it was a dominant process and it was fast enough, what would be the fate of those planets? Okay, so let me be bold. If I put them there, they're rotating much faster than the ambient stellar wind. So they will lose angular momentum to the star and they will just uh, have an orbital decay. So the fate due to magnetic interaction of all these planets will be just to fall off on their, on their host stars. Okay, if it occurs, if it occurs. If I put them there, then it's the other way around. For those, they will just be expelled. And this one here will fall down to the star. But because of the structure of the wind here, you have a stable line here, which was not the case in this region. Okay. Uh, so to conclude on this, uh, just naive ideas you can get from uh, from stellar wind structure, I, I, I would like to remind you that when you do the computation for actual topologies, things get much much more complicated. I mean, this is so. This is uh, one case we I, I'm developing right now. Uh, all those models I will I will show you in 3D. And we are using some uh, observed magnetic maps uh, of some known stars to drive the stellar wind. So this is for HD 189733. Uh, and and uh, so we, the, the, uh, the shape you get here is the Alvin surface transition in the stellar winds that you're developing. Okay. And in 3D, you also get a Parker spiral, right? So yep. does that change any of these interactions as the orientation of the magnetic? It does. It does indeed, as you will see. Yeah, yeah, it does. The magnetic topology is the, is the key, uh, is a key uh, player here to determine whether or not this kind of interaction will have a huge impact on the, uh, on the evol typically uh, migration of a planet. Also, okay. So now, now that I say, okay, we know winds where this can occur and it could be important, but what are, what are the amplitude of these effects? So the question I will try to provide some insights. Um, that's certainly not definitive answer, the best insights, let's say, is what are the secular effects of those interactions? What controls their strengths and what are the associated, associated time scale typically to planet migration due to that? So if I take, uh, so this is one of the first 3D simulation I did. All the things I will show you are 2D, but just a nice picture to show, to explain what I'm, I'm going to talk to, to you about. So the secular effects uh, can be decomposed into several pieces. First, the perturbation the planet is inducing in the wind can, can propagate back to the star in the subalvanic uh, interaction. So you can actually do some perturbation on the, on the photosphere of the star, typically. And depending on where this 
uh, link takes you on the surface of the star, you can uh, modify the stellar wind, how is it, it's driven locally. No, it can definitely be shifted. Yeah, indeed. Actually, that's that's a good point. That this this uh, this picture it kind of is kind of um, uh, not not a good example. But in this case, the transition occurs really uh, inside. In fact, so so here in this exact picture, in this exact simulation, no no, no information is propagating back, and that's why those field lines here are not uh, elongated due to the interaction with the planet. But you can. Normally, if it was closer, you would have a, an extension. Yeah, definitely. Now, that, that's something I will argue now. Because of the magnetic connection you get between the two bodies, you can transfer directly angular momentum between the two because torques are developing in the systems. And finally, due to this transfer angular momentum, you can have a planet migration. That is interesting. So I will now uh, describe all these things in uh, try to assess the effect of the interaction on all these aspects of the problem uh, from numerical simulation I developed. So we're going back to 2D, axis symmetric for the first for a first study because uh, this is quite a, a new study, so we wanted to keep things as simple as possible for a first step. So this is a, an image of a, of a stellar wind simulation, the same kind of stellar wind simulation I was showing you right before. And in this stellar wind simulation, I put a boundary condition inside it, which is a circular planet. Now, since this is 2D axisymmetric, this planet is actually a torus around the star. So every result I'm going to show you needs to be rescaled, and it's kind of a, an upper limit that I'm trying to assess with those, uh, with those uh, numerical simulations. I will consider in this work uh, various orbital radii. I will, not, I will not change the wind structure, okay? So if you, you're looking closely here, I will always know where is the uh, alvanic transition in the wind, and then we have to rescale the results. If you change the, double, the, the structure of the wind, then of course you have to, well, what I'm trying to say is that you have to think about the orbital radius, not in absolute, but in distance, typically to the transition in the, in the wind. I considered, uh, so, what is exactly this boundary condition? And I think this is one of the most critical aspects of this work is that it's really simple. And if I'd be more happy to hear your suggestion, what, what should we do about that to, to be more uh, uh, precise, to be more, more correct, basically. So the, the planet boundary condition is just, I impose zero velocity inside this zone here. And I, in the azimuthal direction, I suppose that it has a Keplerian orbital velocity. So this is typically for a circular orbit planet. In real system, anyway, planets such that are such close are supposed to be tidally locked or something like that, or at least circularized due to due tidal interactions. I think the pressure such that it's uh, lower than the ambient um, um, uh, stellar wind pressure, so that I do not drive any flows from this boundary basically due to a, a pressure gradient. And I, I fix it so that it is a low temperature uh, planet. And then I fix density inside this planet to be higher, generally higher than what's surrounding. And uh, eventually, magnetic field or not. I consider both cases. I will get into more detail about that. There are two parameters that I will keep fixed in all this study. These are the planet radius, which is considered, which is quite a big planet, 10% of the stellar radius, and its mass. Basically, the mass here uh, appears mainly in the, uh, I have the gravitational field uh, potential, typically, of the planet that is here. And those, so, yep, so. Oh, okay, it's the gravity of the planet that you about. So, the magnitude of boundary conditions, do you put them throughout the, the, the torus or at the, at the boundary of the torus? Well, throughout the, throughout the torus, but in fact, since I do not evolve equations here, it doesn't matter what's really inside, up to a few points, grid points that are used in the cells that are inside the physical domain. So I make sure that, because if I do down there, then I have high magnetic fields and the cause quick tries to calculate the time step and it's just no nonsense. So I just make sure that I have enough grid points here so that I, I influence with the surroundings, but that's all. As a technical question, you're basically moving into a frame of the planet and you're just having the winds. Exactly, exactly, yes. Yes, it is encouraged. 
You mean inside the boundary here? Uh, so on there's the a boundary. on the boundary here. Yeah. Oh, I'd say no. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, in this situation, in this simulation, no. I mean, I, there's, there's a there's a boundary condition that really affects the uh, imposed value of the magnetic fields so of the magnetic field. Doesn't have a field or anything. Yes, it is this field here. Oh, it does. Yeah. So. Initially, when I initialize my simulation, I add the two fields, this theta wind uh, dipolar, initial dipolar field, and the dipolar field for the, for the planet. And then as the simulation goes on, in the boundary condition here only, I impose that the field remains the same. Okay. And so the equation is solved in the frame rotating uh, at, the, at the Kaplan speed. Okay, and uh, so this is not completely uh, nuts in terms of parameters because uh, uh, we know some systems, uh, observed systems, that have such uh, planetary radius ratios, mass ratios, and orbital uh, uh, distance to their stars. No, it doesn't spin. Yeah, no, 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 no. it's a torque. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, exactly, 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 exactly. To 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 assess uh, whether my initial uh, conditions were uh, robust, I did some simulation where I initialized the whole magnetosphere sphere as rotating with the with the uh, as, at the play on speed, and I get essentially the same result in the end. So that's that's all uh, Korean, yeah, robust with respect to that, and so. To be more, a bit more specific. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So to be more specific, I try to distinguish two cases. One, which is called in the literature the unipolar interactor, where you consider that the planet has no um, uh, magnetic field at all. Uh, internal, well, self-sustained magnetic field. And then you have many different situations that may occur, and the magnetic field of the ambient stellarine may permeate in the inside the planet. And depending on the, uh, typically, the, uh, the uh, uh, resistivity you get inside the planet, you can have two extreme cases. One where you just dissipate magnetic field inside your planet, and when, when, where uh, the magnetic field are just frozen inside the planet and you drag magnetic field lines around. Uh, because of this uh, axisymmetric uh, setup, I cannot explore everything here, and so I just can do this case, which is a dragging one. Uh, so this is one uh, when I will refer in the following to unipolar cases to remind that I consider no dissipation inside the planet, it's just that the field line are just dragged around by this torus, right? And this is the kind of situation I get here. I show the azimuthal magnetic field in a, so forget about the units, it's a code unit. I mean, all, everything is adimensionalized anyway. And so you see the uh, magnetic field lines in black. In, in, in red, it's magnetic field lines too, but I put it in red so that you, sh you see those that are close to the planet vicinity. And you see that you develop a strong uh, elongated uh, structure uh, this is the so this is the color code in behind. I, I recall you with the azimuthal magnetic field, and you see you have very strongly elongated in the azimuthal direction uh, magnetic field lines, and you can compare to the ones that are here. You see that it's a, a bit black here, a bit white here. So it's you are much much strong, strongly elongated due to the interaction with the planet, and those black and white regions here are just due to the fact that the wind is just trailing behind your your rotating star. Is there a current sheet there, or am I looking reading the picture? No, there is, yeah. There is? Or mm -hmm. There is a current sheet? Yes, there is, yeah. Uh, so, uh, to put it in a nutshell, what's nice here is that you develop a current loop, in fact, between the two bodies here. And so this is really like the Io jupiter interaction case done that you can find in many papers in the literature. In the case of dipolar fields, I consider various inclinations of the magnetic field. Uh, so this is a, an unusual case, right? I mean, the magnetic field axis of the planet points towards the star. Uh, so here at the boundary condition I was uh, referring to before. Uh, and you see that if you look it from far away, well, it looks kind of the same as before, right? I mean, we have very strongly elongated magnetic field lines 
uh, connecting the two bodies here. It's just that in the vicinity of the planet, of course, it's completely different, but you induce kind of the same thing uh, here. Okay, and I, as it will uh, appear much clearly, uh, clearer in the following, this inclination has a huge impact on what kind of torque you can expect from this kind of setup here. Okay. So that's what you get uh, uh, after some transient. Yes, exactly. Yep. I always, all the simulation I will show you here is go through a, a transient when you develop this kind of structure and then reach a steady state. Because of the axisymmetric uh, aspect of the problem, it's kind of, it's quite easy to get a, a steady state. You probably wouldn't get a steady state, right? You'd get wobbling. So if you, if you, uh, if you keep uh, an axisymmetric uh, structure for your wind, you're likely to get a steady state, I guess. Uh, if not, then of course you will transit uh, from one state to the other as the planet orbit around the star, so you will never get one. No. So why is there a north star uh, That's a very, uh, so, this, in this burial case, case uh, that's just because you're, uh, okay, okay, how should I put this? Uh, Well, I mean, you, you don't expect, it, well, you don't here and there, it's not really not the same thing, so you don't expect to have the same thing. Uh, no? Does it make sense? The, the time, with this orientation, the planetary magnetic field is reflection symmetric about the orbital planet. Yeah. But the stellar field. Exactly, yes, yeah, so that, yeah, that's what I want to, yeah. So you don't expect. In sub in some cases, I get some uh, not truly steady state case, and I have some uh, quasi periodic reconnection events that occur that are a priori numerically driven. But I can always do averages and see what if the results are current with all the other steady states that are well defined. Right? Uh, if I if I try now to estimate the torques that occur in, uh, in, uh, in this kind of systems, the one good thing to do is to just look at the angular momentum flow, flux, basically. So th th those plots are exactly that. The color code in, in behind is the amplitude of the angular momentum flux. So if you, if you screen out the planet, forget about it for, uh, for a moment, then you see that in this region here, it's all uh, blackish and bluish, which is there is no angular momentum flux there. The, the, uh, the, all the plasma here is just rotating with the star solidly. At higher latitudes where there is actually an expanding wind, then you see that it's there that the angular momentum is extracted by the wind from the star and you have angular momentum flowing. And so those lines, those uh, white lines here are the, just the streamlines of the angular momentum uh, flow. Okay. So uh, the combination of both gives you where it occurs and how it occurs. And it's just, it's a calculation. Uh, so you, you just compute, uh, compute the angular momentum, uh, uh, the divergence of all the terms, and then you get, you get a, a flux of angular momentum. If you write uh, the equation of angular momentum, right? Uh, you multiply your Navier-Stokes equations, uh, and then you, you compute all the terms on the, on the right-hand side inside the divergence, the divergent, then you, you can compute that. Right, does it make sense? Uh, I, I don't follow, but is it just magnetic or anything? No, 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 this is the whole, no, I mean, there's no assumption if it's magnetic or not. This is just uh, where angular momentum is willing to go. But it's probably driven by the Maxwell component? It is, in this case it is, yes, but it could be, well, I mean, to, to do this plot here, I, I don't, ex I don't uh, use the... Yes. Is there anywhere where the Reynolds component dominates? <laughs> um, I don't think so in this case, no. No, yeah. Okay, uh, you, you always need to have any hour some flow rights to get to, to propagate on the element. Um, so you see that uh, in the unipolar case, which is this uh, upper plot here, Angular momentum is flowing from the planet to the star, okay? And it, and it, 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 is, uh, it is flowing at a very specific location in latitude at the stellar surface. In a, in a dipolar case, depending on, uh, on the orientation of the background magnetic field, uh, you see that you, you have this component here, the same than, than the one here, but you can also have interaction from the between the planet and the wind, and you have 
you can have uh, angular momentum flowing directly inside the wind. That will heavily depend on uh, how the magnetic field are oriented and where the planet is compared to the exact transition to the uh, to the Alven uh, uh, to the Alven surface. Yeah. And so I will refer those kind of configuration to closed and open configuration where. Closed configuration will always mean that all the angular momentum that is extracted from the planet falls down to the star. And open configuration will mean just that part of it is going to the star and part of it is going elsewhere in the wind. Sorry, I wasn't sure what to put the Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, I should put the third plot here definitely. In this case, there is no magnetic field for the planets, okay? And in this case, uh, the planet has an intrinsic uh, magnetic field. Uh, that is anti-aligned with the background magnetic field. If I did the other way around, if I, if I do the same plot with the exact uh, the magnetic field shifted by pi, basically, still dangle, uh, then it's uh, again a closed configuration. I, I don't have any field lines that open to the, to the stellar wind. Okay. So, uh, coming back to my uh, cardum plot here, uh, let's first assess what is the effect. So basically, how does this affect the, dri the driving of the wind and how the torque applied by the wind, by those angular momentum flows here, uh, changes due to the interaction. But can I go back to the closed configuration? Sure. There's no field at all, so it's just a perfect conducting ring. Yeah. Oh, well, so, okay, yes. So there wasn't any energy flux. It's perfectly conducting is essentially ring. Yes, exactly. I, I reach I reach the state at some point. Okay, that leads to my question because clearly it's the planet, you know, even if you have your torus, right, it's differentially rotating with respect to the star. Exactly. Star rotating. Yeah. Of course it's star. But yeah, you have a differential rotation okay. with the ambient uh, ambient so wind. The field lines that connect between the two are are rotated in the y direction. Yes. And, and then one could imagine some, some actually some opening up effect that could Current, they do, that, they do, that, that yeah, does yeah, that does happen. Okay, so basically the idea, exactly, you see, you see those small lobes here, actually. Yeah. So those are just, you have some, some that are opening and just closing, opening and pop, okay. And there are, so we compare that to ex right. what you would expect from, it does not actually, yeah. Well, yeah. I guess it depends, on yes, yeah. Uh, in ultimately, here it depends on the on the grid because it's supposed to be IDM HD, so that's one concern. That's an yes, so. of course, always, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, so the foot points of the star yeah. uh, diffuse momentarily in the y direction, right? Then you could maintain some steady state. We can go with some centroidal yeah. uh, stress, but then. Well, if you show us the picture from the top, right? They're curved going back to the planet. Or I don't know which one's faster. Is the planet inside or outside? The, the, the planet is, uh, is much faster. Much faster. It's inside a curve, yeah. so they've got forward. Exactly, yeah. yeah. If you get it from the top. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this is, this is 2D. This is symmetric. I cannot show you by the top. But I, I, I have some first results from 3D simulations about that. It's 2.5D, so you have a phi direction for the direction. I do. I do have it. Yeah, but you would see just uh, something that is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I, I, so I've moved on from those, I, I'm going to show you what are the expectations from those 2D simple axisymmetric simulations. And then I'm now developing those things in 3D. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So, stellar wind modification. So, this is kind of, so I try to explain it clearly, this plot. Okay, so we are showing the torque applied by the wind to the star. Okay? Uh, it's normalized to the torque you would expect without any planets. So any point on this line here of one is just that you have no effect of the planet of, on, the, on the wind driving, okay? Here we are, all the points that I show you, uh, the color code is just that the black, the black uh, dots are for the unipolar cases. The, the green triangle for closed configuration where all angular momentum removed from the planet goes back to the star, and the, the down red triangle are for the open configuration. And for each orbital radius here, I have a, a bunch of those which uh, are just exploration of uh, both tilt angle of the dipolar field of the, of the planet and strength of the magnetic field of the planet. Okay, and for a couple of uh, orbital radii here, I just do two cases basically. So. 
if you focus on the, uh, of the, on the, on the black dots here, you see that first, as, as you approach the alvenic transition, the fast alvenic transition in your wind, then of course no information is able to come back to the surface of the star. So you don't expect any modification of the stellar wind torque, which is good because it's what we observe here. Okay. Now, close to the alvenic transition, transition uh, you see that the effect is maximized here for, for the, the, the black dots only, if you focus on the black dots only. The effect is maximized. In fact, this is, so this is weighted because if you're thinking about in this plot here, what I'm doing is I'm moving my planet inward or outward, okay? So if I move my planet inward, then all those lines here will uh, uh, hit the, the, the stellar surface at lower latitude and there, well, if it's really here that it's occurring, then here it doesn't matter for the stellar wind torque because all that matters come from that. So you're not impacting at all the stellar wind driving here if you, if you, if you transform the momentum to this location here. So this is exactly what we observe here is that here you have the effect that is maximized because you, you're right at the transition where it, it matters. And as you come closer to your star, then the effect just is decreased because of course you're not impacting the, 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 the good region in, in your wind. But there's another effect that you're not mentioning here that you are generating different rotation on the stellar surface. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It could be interesting. That's definitely something, I, well, that's definitely something I would like to look into, but uh, I, I have not assessed its effect yet, yeah, In, indeed. And uh, so those dots here, for, for instance, for a three uh, stellar radii orbit, these are just to show you how much the, the effect can change as you just vary topology and magnetic field strength for your planet. This will come much clearer in a minute. But if I if I if I do try to to take into account this uh, this variation by a parameterization, I can recover the unipolar uh, trend here on, by shrinking all those dots on the same point. So basically, everything is coherent is coherent here. Now, if you just so keep in mind that the effect first needs to be rescaled because it's a 2D axisymmetric result. But it's, at, at the same time, it's huge, but it's not that huge. I mean, you're just decreasing by a few tens of percent the, 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 the stellar wind torque. Now, if you estimate the direct transfer of regular momentum due to the magnetic connection that exists between the two bodies there, this effect is much, much far, uh, bigger. This is, again, the same kind of plot. This time, this is the torque applied by the planet to the star, okay? Divided again by the stellar wind torque without planets. So this time, you see that all the points are uh, for negative values, meaning that the torque applied by the planet is, the, on the, is opposite to the torque applied by the wind. So the wind is trying to slow down your star, but here, Angular momentum is transferred from the planet to the star, so the star, this interaction tries to accelerate the star, uh, spin up the star. And this is done only for one orbital radius, this plot, for a, a three stellar radii uh, orbital radius. And I vary the inclination of the planetary field and the color labels the amplitude of the magnetic field, the strength of the planetary field, magnetic field, okay? So for each uh, inclination angle, I vary, I, I do three uh, different uh, magnetic field strengths. If you focus on this case here, which is this one. So this one is for uh, aligned dipoles. For aligned dipoles, you have a very well-defined magnetosphere that develops uh, around your planet. And due to the topological constraints, there are not, uh, the connection at the pole is hard, you have to do to, to, to trace magnetic field all around here to, to be able to, 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 to be topologically compatible with the ambient magnetic field. And so for this case here, you see that as you vary the magnetic field strength, typically the results doesn't vary that much, okay? Your, the, the transfer angle momentum can be quite high because it's something like 40% of the stellar wind torque you would expect, but, but the effect of the magnetic field strength by itself is not that much. As you move to the other, uh, uh, extreme case where you have anti-aligned uh, uh, dipoles, then the, 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 the magnetic field that is going out of the, of the magnetic pole here is directly uh, topologically uh, coherent with, with the ambient field. And so you have a direct connection that is very easy to establish, basically. 
And so here you have a huge effect of the magnetic field strength. Okay, and as you transit from one to the other, you have a, you, you have a complex uh, dependency, but I, so I can, I computed a, a way to parameterize that, which is a label here. Uh, so it's again this, this torque as a function of the ratio basically of the uh, magnetic field uh, of the planet divided by the magnetic field of the star here. It's a magnetic moment, dipole moment, and the inclination angle. Yes? How big is the ratio? What, well, what's the angle that the field rotates from the surface of the star to the planet? Sorry, can you repeat that? I what's, didn't get it. What's the angle that the field rotates from the surface of the star to the planet? No. Okay, the, uh, the, the, the dephasing, yeah. Uh, so that the ratio of the foil. Yes, exactly. So uh, the ratio of, uh, oh, I have that somewhere. I don't have it on top of my head. Well, I do have that somewhere in my paper. I'm I'm sorry. Asking, yeah. So I'm just trying to understand the quarter magnitude here. Okay. Yes. So remember the classical um, picture of the Parker wind where at the Alphane surface, the troidal and troidal field components are comparable, right? That's the surface where inertial and maxwell stresses in the troidal direction are comparable. And in the field beyond that, it gets wound back. Into yes. The okay. So at the Alphane surface, um, you should have comparable troidal and troidal in the open wind. If you had comparable troidal and troidal in the, in the field connecting the planet to the star, the ratio of the torques should be off to the ratio of the open flux to the flux connecting planet and star, right? So you can see that, of course, the assumption of axis symmetry would be to significantly overestimate the, the Absolutely. planet torque mm -hmm. by you know, 2 pi r planet. Exactly, yeah. Eight, all, eight all, eight this, planet. all these results need to be rescaled this way, yeah. So that's a pretty large factor. Yes. But aside from that, looking at your picture, um, you know, it looked like only a small fraction of the stellar flux, magnetic flux, is connecting to the planet. Yes, indeed. So how do you get an order unit of the perturbations of the stellar spin down torque? So that's just that so that's exactly your question. In fact so that it so if you have a, a very strong torque exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then if you go, if you actually go to three D where you are now considering only one flux tube connecting a you know a, a really, you know, mm -hmm. almost point like planet to the to the star. It's hard to imagine it wraps around, you know. No, it will not wrap that much, yeah. But you can only reach Absolutely. Troidal yes, coil, yes. And then it will be unstable and open out. And Absolutely, yeah. OK, and so if I uh, plot those results now as a function of the orbital distance, uh, so now it's again the same color code, so uh, unipolar and different configurations when the planet is magnetized. I can, this is a log, log scale now here, and log scale here too. You see that I get a, a clear dependency for the, at least the unipolar uh, cases uh, as a function of the orbital radius as, as long as I'm well inside the dead zone. And I, as soon as I approach the, um, uh, the easy transition region where I go to the super alvenic uh, region of the wind, then then all this, this scaling just falls down, of course. Okay, uh, as you were saying, uh, we need to multiply those results because of the 2D axisymmetric aspect of the, of the problem. And for this torque applied by the planet to the star, so it scales here like uh, the orbital radius to the, by, to the minus four. And in fact, so if I rescale, it's uh, orbital radius to the minus five. And in paper, they try to estimate that from analytical uh, consideration for only the unipolar interactor case. It's very consistent with, with that. From the top of my head, it's minus 5.5. .5, so it's really, uh, cons those, those, those scaling, those trends are really coherent here. Uh, OK, finally. Uh, finally, the effect on the uh, planet migration here. So first, uh, if, uh, if, I, if I show you uh, one picture of uh, one uh, very first uh, uh, one of the very first uh, numerical simulation I did in 3D. So this is an early stage of the simulation. It's not steady states yet. Those field lines, you see that you have some kind of bending here, but it would certainly be bended more if I waited more. It's not yet steady states, but I, I, at least I'm getting there. Uh, the, the torque that you, uh, you, uh, you apply to the planet, typically that will eventually make it migrate, comes from the connections you get here. Uh, typically this is a favorable case where 
topologically you can easily connect the two, uh, the two dipoles. Uh, so in order to verify that, uh, what I did in those early simulations is that I integrated the flux of angular momentum over sphere, spheres, concentric sphere over the planet. Since I need to conserve angular momentum, I expect for this total angular momentum uh, to be constant as a function of this integration radius of the sphere, right? Uh, and so this is what I do here. And you see, in total, the angular momentum flux uh, that is going out of the planet. And you see that it's completely flat, flat as a function of this integration radius around my, uh, my planet. So that's nice. I'm conserving angular momentum in my, uh, in my numerical simulation. And then I could do the same to all the terms that are making uh, angular momentum flowing out. So ram pressure, magnetic tension, thermal pressure, and magnetic pressure, basically. And those are labels labeled here. And this is the boundary of the planetary magnetosphere. So this is ill-defined, because if you, if you check this uh, here, you see, of course, that on the front and in the, in the back, the magnetosphere size is not exactly uh, the same. The same goes on for, uh, in, the, in between the planet and the star and uh, in, on the night side. Uh, but uh, but if, you, uh, if I take the maximum uh, magnetospheric size here, I, I get this line, OK? So, so you see that at this, if you, if, you, if you see here, that mainly what's making angular momentum, what extracts angular momentum from the planet is the magnetic tension of the connecting field lines. Okay? The other terms are not playing at all here in this particular case. If I do the same thing for another three early 3D simulation I did for now this kind of magnetosphere, then, of course, the, the picture is quite different because, well, I have a combination of both magnetic effects, magnetic pressure and magnetic tension that gives me the, the final torque, the final angular momentum loss I have for the planet. And, and this, um, this torque is always much, much low, lower than the, in, uh, in the other case, of course. So coming back to my... So What's nice with that is, that is that if you considering this 2D axisymmetric setups, I do have in my simulations uh, the plan where those magnetic field lines can connect or not. And so I can assess what amount of angular momentum is lost by what would be in planet and have a, an idea that is not completely unphysical. And if I do that, and I try to compute actual numbers by putting some, by uh, getting rid of my, uh, um, a, a dimensionalized unit. So if I specify a, a, a given magnetic field strength and rotation rate from the, my star, then all my units are set, are set, and then I can estimate what is the migration time scale associated with the, with the, the angular momentum loss of the planet. And so this is again the same, co the same code for, from all those simulations as a function of orbital radius and configuration interaction, interaction uh, configuration of the interaction. And you see that for closing planets, you can have uh, estimates of the planetary migration times that are not that long, and ca that can be comparable to uh, typically tidal, uh, tidal uh, migration timescales. So this tells us that maybe this kind of interaction plays a role in the migration path of uh, closing planets and should be considered when you try to assess whether or not the system is stable or things like that. Yes? Mm -hmm. When you have planets tidally migrating, the uh, inclination of the orbital plane is also very important. Absolutely. Could yeah. that become more important as well? Oh, it, it could, it could uh, make this picture much more complex. Uh, I mean, this is only for uh, circular orbits, right? Uh, so another way of seeing this is that if, you're in, if you have an inclination compared to this time, the dominant mode of the, uh, of, the, of the magnetic field of the star, then as the planet orbits, you're just consistently changing the orientation of the field you're seeing. And then you're switching between all these points here, basically. OK. The reason I'm asking is that this is the case for cool stars. Yes. There is a transition between the distribution of planets and their inclination with respect to the star, depending if the star is cool or not. So what that's why the magnetic sphere is important or not. I guess that could be a main driver or possibly driver. Change yeah, yeah. the 
Okay, so in those cases, uh, so all these all all these uh, triangles here are for various uh, strengths of the planet magnetic field uh -huh. and orientations. Uh -huh. It has no field for the black circles, yes. And so once I've set uh, physical units for the stellar magnetic field, all the other units, all the units of the planetary field is also typically uh, those cases here. Okay, the magnetic field of the planet goes from something like. Uh, 10 times the ambient stellar wind uh, strength at the position of the planet to uh, a thousand, almost a thousand. Yeah. Okay, and, and in the case where the planet up to almost a thousand, a thousand corresponds to the top. Uh, so the thousand for these ones corresponds to the bottom ones because this is a migration time scale, so, but that's uh, okay. Yeah. But then, in the case where there's no magnetic field, okay, can you explain the bounding condition of the imposed magnetic field? Okay, in the case of there is no magnetic field, I do not impose anything at all on the magnetic field. I just have a blob of uh, high density called plasma. And that's all. And that is dragging around a magnetic field. And no velocity. And a uh, couple of velocity. It's just a conductor? Yeah. It's a perfect. The perfect conductor. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. When I, so unipolar cases are highly unrealistic in that regard in those simulations. I mean, in the fact that, net, well, maybe you are overestimating that. But I mean, I can. One step beyond this, of course, would be to consider that there is some small resistivity there and assess how those values change. That's something I want to do. But yeah, let me wrap up maybe. And so. Conclusions, <laughs> I'm done. Uh, so the conclusion of this work was to say that closing planets, there is good chance that they interact very strongly with their, uh, uh, magnetically with their, with the stellar ambient stellar wind and with their hosts. Uh, if we want to assess that, we first need to know where is the alvenic transition in the stellar wind they're uh, orbiting. In order to do that and to be confident about that, we need several things for a, say a given star. We need to know for this star its rotation, its magnetic field, its mass loss rate, and its coronal temperature. If you don't have those four parameters, all the models miss one information and need to suppose something. You do so. You always have to be uh, uh, careful with what you, you're saying about the wind of a given star. The magic interactions between the star and the planet strongly depends on the strengths and on the topology of both fields. And this is, uh, I think, highly clear in the, in the plots I've shown you in this, in this talk. I would argue that given the, the, the estimates I get from those very simple models, a planet could a priori migrate due to star-planet magnetic interaction. Now then, so all those results are published in an NAPJ paper that was out, I think, in October or November 2014. If you want to check the details or just discuss with me, I'm here until the end of the day. Uh, some perspective, I definitely want to improve my planetary boundary condition in various cases. So I'm really looking, if you have any uh, advice for me about that, I would be really grateful for that. I like to go beyond the ILD ideal image, the approximation, of course. Uh, there is a political code. There are several things that are developed. And uh, all MHD have been introduced by several groups. So that's something I could consider, too, to do so for, so for such modelization. And of course, consider non axisymmetric or maybe realistic uh, magnetic topologies for the stellar wind. And then estimate for a known system what could be the, the torques. So thank you very much. Just one comment. You know, there's a classical problem of understanding the drive force on a moving, well, conductor through the magnetic field, yes. or also here, the moving magnetic dipole. And strong recommendation here that you, you, you do a, a few simulations like that. You just move the planet with its magnetic field, with the dipole, through a uniform background magnetic field, and really calibrate in 3D yeah. what the drive force mm -hmm. is. But, uh, you know, I, so my, my recollection is, in other contexts, what one finds, basically, is that uh, well, there's an effective radius for planet, of course, which depends on whether it has an magnetic field or not. But, but you have a, you know, a cross-sectional area, yeah. times a velocity, right? And then you have additional factor, so like V over the ambient of thing speed as the sort of the, the, the drag. And then, I 
they worked on the, on the, on the planet. Okay. So, but you would you wouldn't say it depends on topology then? Well, you know, for example, when Carlos Pensuela is here, you know, he's doing related calculations, it offers the force freedom and and he found such a scale. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's just there's there's too much going on here for I think people to have full confidence in mm -hmm. that you have full control over what's going on without having such a calibrated mm -hmm. Um, set of right. I see. Yeah, further questions have to be <laughs> I'm sure we'll move upstairs and <laughs>